and get started with producing the actual lecture book. All right. Great. So our first question that we're going to ask um, at the, the beginning of everything, obviously, is uh, what really is artificial intelligence, right? So let me add in. Our first, yeah. So our first question is what is artificial intelligence and what can we define this by? Now, Professor Leo explored this a little bit in our introduction, but in our AI world, we're going to call an AI model anything that takes some sort of input and gives us some other sort of output. Okay, and there are a lot of different AI models. We're going to explore a couple of them in over this weekend. But essentially, all of these models are going to take some sort of input and work in different ways to make different predictions. So these functions, yeah, once again, they're called models. Uh, and they're generally something called RN to RM functions. So just a quick raise of hands. How many people are familiar with that terminology? Okay, great. This is why we're here. Okay, so an RN to RM function is essentially a function where our inputs are going to be a set of n different pieces of information. And in our case, because it's a computer, we're going to represent them with n different numbers. Okay, so that's on the left. And we'll talk a little bit more about how different types of data that aren't necessarily just numeric are encoded later on. But the important part is that our models prefer these types of numeric inputs, right? And so similarly, the output will also be produced in a similar manner. So there'll be m different numeric outputs. That's on the right here, right? That's under the output column. And so because our model here takes n numbers in and produces m outputs, we say that our model is an rn to rm function. That's what we mean by rn to rm, right? So for example, we could have an rn to r1 function where the function takes n inputs and then just gives a single output. So oftentimes this is used in, for example, if you want to say yes or no, right, for, for a computer. One could be yes and zero could be no. There are a couple issues with specifically using that encoding, which we'll explore later on, but that's, you know, that's a proof of concept example. Secondly, we could have, for example, an Rn to R2 function like this, right? So zero could be no and one could be yes. And this is a more common way to encode um, yes and no, or just binary uh, outputs. And again, we'll explore why a bit later in this lecture. And then of course, if we want to look at something a little bit more complex, for example, encoding cat, dog, rabbit, tiger, chicken, um, which are very much not numeric. Um, if we want to encode these inputs into you know, numbers, we can take a look at something called one hot categorical data. And this type of data is often used when we have a couple categories that are mutually exclusive. And so what we're going to do is we're going to use zero to represent something that the input is not, and then one to represent something that the input is, right? So if we look at this example here, the answer is kind of on the screen, but can anyone tell me what we're encoding right now? So what animal are we encoding? You can just shout it out. You can go ahead. Yes, exactly. Now. I hope you know. I hope you didn't just say the green thing. Um, I hope you process that. You know, the rabbit isn't one. Everything else is zero, right? So that's a rabbit. But that's an example of one-hot encoding. And the reason we're going to do this, as opposed to, for example, using a scale from zero to four. Um, so we could say zero is cat, one is dog, two is rabbit, and so on, right? Why doesn't that work? Because that's just one number. It's less data. The reason is because. It gives us this one hot uh, encoding gives us a bit more clarity on what category our data is in. So if we were to use the scale, we're essentially saying that a rabbit is halfway between a cat and a chicken. And if you've taken any form of biology, you know that that's not how that works, right? And so in a similar manner, if we wanted to make predictions and output in one hot categorical form, if we were to predict like 2.78, that means nothing because it's neither a rabbit nor a tiger, and it's you usually shouldn't have you know a cross between a rabbit and a tiger because that just doesn't make much sense and so that's kind of 
one benefit of one-hot categorical. And then the other benefit is that we can make probabilistic predictions. So we could say we're 70% sure that it's a rabbit, 20% sure that it's a dog, 5% that it's a cat, 5% that it's a chicken, and 0% that it's a tiger. And so that's going to come in handy as well once we get into um, classification algorithms, which is something we'll talk about later. Yes. So right now, like what the slide is saying is because there's a one for rabbit, that means like, yes, we have rabbit. Yes, so the one is saying we are 100% sure that this is a rabbit, and the zero is saying we're 0% sure of anything else. So the, this happens more on the output side. We could have 0 0.9, 0 0.1, 0, 0, 0, and we would say it's 90% you know, dog or something. But in this case, yes. So we're saying we're 100% sure that this is a rabbit. Yes. Also, I think I heard you say that like the computer prefers like numeric input instead of I guess categorical. Mm -hmm. And so like, could you elaborate on that? Yeah. So the way most um AI algorithms are implemented in terms of code is that they're done with a lot of linear algebra and sort of linear algebra libraries and languages. And so there's a lot of matrices and vectors. And in matrices and vectors, you know, multiplying cat by rabbit takes no meaning um, unless you assign those categorical categorical inputs into numbers or like cat equals four or something. And so that's why we're we're gonna use you know numeric inputs as opposed to categorical inputs. Right? Does everything everything make sense? Good. Okay. So essentially by changing the shapes of these inputs and outputs, we can use these linear algebra algorithms as uh, I just mentioned, and we can represent a lot of different problems. So this principle of input, model, output, okay? Where the model is, by the way, not explicitly coded to do anything. So we're not saying like, if you're if this is a rabbit, then we're gonna multiply by five. If this is a dog, we're gonna multiply by three. There's none of that, right? The model isn't explicitly coded to, to do anything, it's gonna learn what to do. And this idea is the bigger idea kind of behind the field of AI and machine learning, okay? So does anyone have any further questions before we move on? Everything good? Makes sense. All right. So let's start by revisiting supervised learning uh, under this context a little bit. So supervised learning algorithms, uh, once again, that is, as you can see on screen, the machine learning task of learning a function that maps an input to an output based on various example input-output pairs. Okay, so it's going to infer a function from labeled training data, and that's really important here, labeled, right? Um, consisting of a set of training examples. And so supervised learning models take data that is already labeled and prepared. Okay, I'm gonna say that one, one more time because it's kind of important. Supervised learning models take data that is already labeled and prepared, which means we know what the outputs are, we know what inputs correspond to those outputs, and we're gonna use that to build our model. So at the moment, supervised learning is actually the most widely used machine learning technique because it's very short-term feasible and it's relatively easy to implement, right? So some people have said that over 95% of today's applications are supervised learning. And so what happens usually in supervised learning is that you have a set of input-output pairs, uh, which we'll call features and labels. So features are inputs, labels are outputs, um, and then you train based on these features and labels and you infer uh, a model or you infer a function that is used to make these predictions. And so all of this, this kind of supervised learning class of algorithms is the most widely used technique uh, currently in real world applications. And so once again, if you're not familiar with the terms features and labels, you can see on page two of the, uh, the reference sheet, the resource sheet, there are a bunch of you know, different terms spanning different fields uh, in case, you know, you're more familiar with one of those terms. Yeah, if I can, if I can just butt in um, and just really hone in on why supervised learning is so potent in the AI field um, with just an example. So imagine trying to study for a really big math test. Um, a normal traditional AI approach would say, all right, you take these problems, you have a practice test. And you take problems you don't understand at all, and you just brute force your way through trying to understand them, do everything you possibly can, try to figure out what you're doing wrong. You're off all night trying to figure out what's going on, right? 
supervised learning, on the other hand, is say you have a practice test and you have an answer. Now you can try to work through the problems, but you can corroborate your answers and see what you're doing wrong. That's why having this paired approach where you have the right answers already given to you and using those to train is very, very important for AI models. Yes. So then I guess like what are the pros and cons of supervised learning versus like unsupervised? Yeah, so we'll talk more about unsupervised learning actually tomorrow, but supervised learning is A, kind of more feasible in the short term and B, more easy to implement because unsupervised learning takes, there are various different types of unsupervised learning, but generally they're taking, um, they're taking, you know, unlabeled data and they're inferring their own labels. So sometimes that might not come out the same way. Sometimes you know, it might flat out infer the wrong labels. Sometimes the labels might not be clearly defined. And sometimes it might just see like, it might see something false that isn't there. And so it's a little bit harder to make sure you have good unsupervised learning outputs. However, on the plus side, it is creating those outputs. So you don't need to label, you know, that data. For example, if I had a set of 15,000 pictures of like various different animals, I don't need to label it because a computer vision algorithm could just say like, it could use an unsupervised learning technique to, you know, identify these are the types of images that look like dogs. These look like cats, right? And so with supervised learning, you need a lot of data that's labeled um, that you can kind of, that you know is good data. We'll talk about good data later as well, but you need a lot of good quality data in order to implement this uh, or in, in order to build like an effective model. So, <clears throat> Why is supervised learning so uh, versatile and yeah, yeah, yes. like, so would another example would be like looking at company data and like stock behavior and like trying to draw a connection between the two. Um, company data as in like size, like their like, like uh, performance, performance. And stuff. yeah, yeah. So, I, I mean, we'll go into a couple examples later on, but absolutely, there are supervised learning algorithms that do like stock predictions and like um, essentially help you get more money. <laughs> So absolutely, yes. So as you can see, you know, supervised learning is pretty versatile. So what types of supervised learning are there or what primary types of supervised learning algorithms exist to make it so versatile? Well, firstly, classification. Um, and that's the first of two sort of big classes that we're going to talk about today. Not to, no pun intended, right? But that's the first of two uh, of the big supervised learning classes that we're gonna talk about today. And classification is where you take in a set of inputs and then you use them to predict these types of discrete categorical data. Um, for example, as you can see on screen, uh, will it be cold or hot tomorrow, right? So it could be cold or hot. It could be a spam email or it could not be a spam email. It could be a red wine versus a white wine. And you'll understand the wine example you know, as we do more uh, labs, but essentially all this is saying um, is that it can either be one thing or it can be another thing. Um, and we're going to call those classes or categories here. Okay. So what does classification do? It takes in data and outputs the class, the category that the model thinks is most likely. And the one thing to write down if you're taking notes or if you're typing along is that classification is discrete, okay? D-I-S-C-R-E-T-E, -E, not discrete as in like subtle or like quiet, but discrete, okay? Because it makes specific predictions for specific categories or specific classes. Uh, in comparison to that, regression is going to predict a continuous quality. So, or a continuous quantity, sorry. So can anyone tell me what is the corresponding statement to classification is discrete that you should write down? Yes. Regression is continuous. Exactly. So regression is continuous, right? So that might be what temperature is it going to be tomorrow? Or like how likely is it for an email to be spam? Or how likely is it for you to survive a, a specific disease? Or like what quality on a continuous scale from one to 10 is this one? Okay, so regression is continuous. It's going to take in data and it's going to make a continuous uh, prediction. Okay. So let's do a little practice with these. Um, you're running a company and you want to develop learning algorithms to address each of the two problems. Okay. So you've been hired from this workshop. You did a great job. You learned a lot. Okay. 
and you're going to address these two problems on the board. Okay, so at your, I guess, specific tables, please uh, talk these over. Are they classification or are they regression? Okay, just take, uh, you know, 30 seconds, maybe. All right. What does everyone think? What is the first one? One more time, a bit louder. Yes, good. Okay, and then what's the second one? Yes, exactly. Okay. Uh, one more example. So you're running a company and you want to develop learning algorithms to address each of one problem. You have a large inventory of identical items. You want to predict how many of these items will sell over the next three months. So we already established that's regression, right? Can you also formulate it as a classification problem? Okay, can you also turn this regression problem into a classification problem? Does anyone have any ideas? Yes, please. Uh, you could theoretically assign each individual number, one unit, two unit, three unit, et cetera, as a classification, but that would be a little uh, over a Monday, so to speak. Yes, so it would be very, very tedious. Let's say you had 10,000 items, right? So you'd have to run 10,000 different classifications. Did it sell? Did it not sell, right? Mm -hmm. So that's one possible way. Does anyone else have any ideas? Yes, please. You want to like over <laughs> or under certain amount of items sold? Yeah, so different thresholds, right? So again, 10,000 items, let's say 2,000 items is poor, 4,000 is okay, 6,000 is good, 8,000 is great, 10,000 is excellent or something, right? So that's another way you could classify it. Exactly. So regression and classification, they're not necessarily a dichotomy. You can convert them between one and the other. But there are obviously better ways to, or there are better situations in which to use classification, and there are better situations in which to use regression. Okay. So, does anyone have any questions about the comparison between those two? All right. Great. So, now that we've got a good idea of how machine learning works, let's take a look at the, uh, the data set that we're going to use to explore these algorithms and also uh, a couple examples of of regression classification, right? So often um, speech recognition is, is the task of you know, transcribing spoken words into text. That's one sort of example of what we're gonna do. Uh, facial recognition is another way uh, that we can use you know, these machine learning algorithms. You know, recognizing people's faces, recognizing um, people's identities based on their facial features. So, you know, face ID or Windows Hello, that's an example of this. Um, sentiment analysis in text. So clarifying whether sentiment analysis in text is positive, negative, or neutral. Um, and this one's a bit more challenging because of, you know, dealing with the context and more colloquial expressions of words. So for example, the word like sick, that could be like, Yo, that was a sick trick, right? Like if you're if you're a skateboarder or something, I don't know. You know, yo, that was a sick trick. That obviously means that was a good trick. That was a great trick, right? Whereas I feel sick, that's obviously negative. You don't want to feel sick unless you're a skateboarder, I guess. I don't know. But sentiment analysis systems kind of need to take into account the context and the surrounding words. So that one's a little challenging. Um, clarifying emails as spam or non-spam. We talked about this uh, in our examples. Fraud detection as well. Um, so classifying credit card transactions as, you know, is it fraud? Is it not fraud? Is it likely fraud? Uh, again, based on these various different data points, such as amount of money spent, you know, time, frequency of purchase, stuff like that. Um, recommendation as well. Recommendation systems, you know, are used to recommend, recommend various different types of content. So like Spotify, music, Netflix, TV shows, stuff like that. Um, Stock price prediction. So, like we were saying, um, you know, using past performance, using company metrics, using 
stuff like that to determine where the stock is going to go from here and what investments you can make. Um, food, and then finally, food quality and safety prediction as well. So given, you know, these vast data sets containing sensory profiles of different food products and like how good they historically are, how what is considered, you know, good and healthy, what is considered bad and unhealthy, given all of that, you know, learning the relationships between the input features in order to kind of assign quality scores or even augment the quality scores assigned by human experts, right? So essentially, we need to consider that not all of these models are ever going to be perfect. In fact, more than likely, none of them are ever going to be perfect. Okay, so they're always going to be wrong in some regard. However, some of these models are also useful. So sometimes this usefulness outweighs the potential for being wrong. And that's another central question that we ask when we're considering AI is, you know, to what extent can we accept these wrong models? To what extent can we accept like, you know, if, if, if a cancer prediction model is 99% accurate, what happens to that 1%? Do we use that model or do we not use that model? Uh, what if it's 99.9% .9 accurate, right? And so that's, one that's one thing to consider when we're learning all of these machine learning algorithms and AI algorithms in this class. Keep in mind that there are assumptions that are made and there are problems that are th this model is specifically built for, and that no AI model is really a one size fits all thing, right? So that's another thing that's important when we're going through our lab exercises and our lectures. So now we can look at our actual data set. Uh, jumped the gun a bit before. Um, our wine data set is going to, it's from the UCI uh, machine learning database. And right away, when we look at this page, uh, can anyone tell me what jumps out at you? Maybe the big red circle, right? What does that represent? What is circled on that screen there? Yes. The big columns? Yeah. So it's the number of attributes, which is essentially the number of columns in our data set. Okay. And there are 12 attributes here. And... To be honest, there's, a, there's actually also a hidden 13th attribute, which is the output, which is the wine quality. But 12 attributes is already a lot of data um, in, say, a, a traditional sense. However, as you'll see later, 12, 12 attributes is actually not that much data in terms of AI. So if we're going to want to build these effective models, we're going to have to manage all 12 of these columns across, it was around 6,000 data points in this data set uh, of red and white wines. So how are we gonna do that, right? Let's take a look at each of the 12 separate attributes then. So we can see that we have uh, fixed acidity, volatile acidity, citric acid, residual sugar, you, you can read the rest. Okay, they're all on the screen. And we're gonna call, one more time, we're gonna call each of these attributes features of our data. So one of these uh, columns, so to speak, is one feature, okay? And our sample is going to have 12 of these features. So once again, we have, you know, we have 12 columns, and we're going to essentially represent this when we put it into our machine learning functions with a 12 dimensional vector that we represent uh, with these square brackets here. Okay. So this is kind of the input that we're going to work with when we're using this wine quality data set. So if we want to predict wine quality, um, based on these 12 features, then we're going to do this by taking the different data points, uh, crunching some numbers, and then rating the wine quality as a number between zero and 10, right? So obviously we're gonna need a model for that. Um, does anyone wanna make a guess as to what type of model we're gonna be using? So is it regression? Is it classification? Is it other? Is it, what is it? Yes. Regression? Yes. So we're going to use um, a couple of different types of regressions to predict this one quality data set. So the first one we're going to talk about is linear regression. Okay. And if you've ever taken stats, this might sound a bit familiar to you, but linear regression is essentially a simple way to describe the specific relationship between the input features and the output features or the label. Okay. So in our case, our input features are these 12 that we've just talked about, and our output feature is going to be our quality. So our goal for this linear regression is that we want to find the true relationship, the best fitting line, as it were, between the input features and the output feature. 
And so it's hard to graph 12 dimensions, especially on a PowerPoint. So we're just going to, let's just start with one variable. Okay. Because it's a lot simpler and it, I mean, it's actually possible to graph. So some, some examples of, you know, one variable correlations, height versus weight. Um, in our case, acidity versus quality, um, because it's the alphabetically the first, um, the first feature. So if we plot a couple points um, of acidity versus quality, we can see that we get this kind of relatively linear, more or less data set. Okay. And so at a glance, we can see this, you know, roughly, roughly um, linear relationship between the input and the output. Okay. So now that we have this, right, what do we need to do next? Well, we need to generate the line. So let's go ahead and do that. Bang. Okay. That's not a bad line. Um, you might remember that the equation for a line is y equals mx plus b. Does that sound familiar, right? Does that sound, you know, maybe it triggers PTSD, I don't know. Um, but in the context of a linear regression, the slope m will indicate how the prediction changes with each unit increase in the input feature. So that's the slope there. And then the y-intercept b is going to be the value of the output when we receive an input of zero. That's that there. So each line we draw is going to be known as a prediction. And we want to use these different predictions in order to best fit our existing sample from the data set. So let's go ahead and look at a couple different examples of M and B that are going to be represented by a couple different lines. OK, what we're going to do now is we're going to this, this requires everyone's participation. OK, so when I go to the next slide, uh, I think there's two or three examples. I want everyone to cheer if it's a good prediction. And I want everyone to boo if it's a bad prediction. Okay. And this requires everyone's cooperation because if I'm standing here going, yeah, let's go, that sounds awkward. Because I'm the I, like I, I'm the only one doing it, right? But if everyone does it, it'll be very, it'll be really cool. Okay. So really quickly, let's practice with this line. Yeah. Ready? Three, two, one, go. Yeah. That wasn't bad. That wasn't bad. That was a lot better than a couple of the other places we've been. Okay. So three. Two, one, go. <laughs> I heard those claps, by the way. Next one. Yeah. How, okay, really quick. How many people booed? Raise your hand. It's okay, no judgment. How many people cheered? I just, I just thought we were going back and forth. It's okay. It's okay. This one, as you can see, is a little bit mixed, right? So it's just in the middle. We don't know if it's good. We don't know if it's bad. It, it's okay. It's definitely better than the last one where everyone did. So we need a more maybe objective way to determine, you know, how correct a line is or how how good a line is at predicting this, right? How can we do that? How can we evaluate these models objectively? Well, we're going to introduce the concept of error. Okay. And thank you everyone, by the way, for participating. That's, you know, very nice. That's probably one of the best, you know, cheers or boos that we've had so far. So anyway, the error of a line is just a simple measure of how incorrect the line is. So you can see it's represented by those lines in between each specific data point and the prediction line itself. Okay. So there are a variety of different ways that you can calculate this incorrectness. The first one, obviously, just being simple error. And that's just the difference between the predicted value and the actual value. And that's represented by these lines. It's the most simple way. It gets the job done, um, but there are a couple also pertinent issues with these calculations. Most importantly, if we want to penalize large errors, so for example, the pink, the blue, maybe the red dots, right? They're not very close. So if we want to penalize those more, we can't really do that with simple error because an error of five is pretty much comparable to an error of four or three, or maybe even two and a half, right? So in order to rectify these issues, what we're going to do is we're going to introduce something called sum of squares error. Uh, I've also heard it called method of least squares or like least squares regression or something like that, right? So all we're going to do is instead of just taking the sum of the differences, we're going to square those differences and we're going to take that sum. And this solves the problem of weighting, so to speak, by magnifying those larger errors. You can see the pink, the red, and the blue square are now significantly bigger than the green and the orange and the black. OK, and so now we want to minimize the sum of squares error in order to get our best line. OK, so now, you know, in the future, if you were to think about that cheer boo test, OK, you can 
I, I wouldn't recommend calculating some of squares error, especially with 10,000 data points, but you can keep that in the back of your mind when you're kind of thinking about whether to cheer or boo. And hopefully we all have, you know, the, the, you know, the, the majority is closer together or there's more of a majority, right? So to calculate the sum of squares difference, we're going to use this very fancy uh, big function. Yes. Also, for the purpose of like squaring it, like I've heard that, mm -hmm. um, like if you want to add it together, like um, kind of like normalizing it, like if it's negative or positive, but you also said like to make it more like noticeable that it's like a bigger difference. Is that right? Uh, is is the question like, no, um, I guess normalizing whether it's a down like down regulator versus up regulator. So it's like the purpose of squaring is the difference. What is the purpose of, of squaring? Yeah. So. Yes, in some senses, it's to make sure that, you know, when we're adding it together, that you don't get like negative three plus five, because that, you know, that doesn't really work. But also, it's mainly to, yeah, weight those errors based on how big they are. So an error of 10 would become 100, whereas an error of five might only become 25. And so making that comparison really, really pop out, so to speak, makes sure that we're fixing those larger errors first. And we're kind of less focused on the micro corrections with, for example, this this black dot here, right? Or this green dot. And does that help with like finding the outliers as well? Um, we'll talk a bit more about how to manage like outliers and like bad data, so to speak, Um, I think tomorrow. But yes, some of Square's error can help a little bit, but you know, we prefer to use other techniques. Okay. Anyone else have any questions? Okay, good. So let's let's move on to the cost function. Okay, so this cost function, it looks a little intimidating. And if we break it down, it's actually not that intimidating. So let's, let's just go ahead and do that, right? So firstly, we're gonna start with the difference between the predicted and the actual values. And one thing to note here is our notation. Okay, so you're gonna hear me say this a lot. So I'll just start, I'll just go ahead and start now. Y hat is predicted. And then Y without the hat, is actual, okay? So y hat predicted, y actual. Everyone, three, two, one, let's say it together, ready? y hat predicted, y actual, okay, good. So after we calculate this difference between the predicted and the actual values, we're going to go ahead and sum the square, we'll square it and then sum the squared differences. Uh, and that's kind of our total error across all of our predictions. And then obviously we're gonna divide it uh, by the number of samples in order to get the mean error and not grossly overcorrect. Okay, so now that we've gotten our error or our cost, we've just calculated it, great. And then we can now iterate uh, and adjust the line kind of in order to make sure that our line is, is a good line, is worthy of cheers and not booze. Okay, so usually the process of um, fixing these errors or using this cost function is something called gradient descent. It's a bit more iterative and it goes into the nitty gritty of like calculus a little bit. Uh, we don't need to worry about that uh, or worry about the term of gradient descent. We just need to know that our goal is always to minimize the cost function, okay? And you'll see why when we talk to, uh, about our first lab. So before we move on, I'm just curious, how many people know who this character is? Or like what this, what this character comes from? If you know, raise your hand, hi. Good, good, good. Please, what is this? What is, what is this? Uh, I forget the exact name of it, but it's a webcomic, uh, XKCD, is that? Exactly, it? yes. So Randall Monroe's XKCD. Um, so we'll call this this guy XKCD guy. If you guys have any names for him, please let me know because I'm not very creative. Um, but XKCD guy raises a good question. How can we take our one-to-one -one example and move it back into our 12 features in the original data set, right? So when we talk about higher dimensional linear regression, it's really very similar to one dimensional linear regression. We're just adding 12 dimensions instead of one. And so it's, it's again, it's impossible to plot in a PowerPoint, but we can use something that's called hyperplanes, which just has more dimensions, but is relatively similar in math. So this is the analog of a 12 dimensional line, um, which is included here. And we can see that our original linear equation down here, y equals mx plus b is mirrored by this 12, uh, 12 variable 
linear or I guess hyperplanar equation where each variable uh, has its corresponding weight or slope. And then we, of course, have our intercept, okay? And you can also see y hat, y hat predicted, okay? You can see y hat as well. So one key assumption we make, uh, and this calls back to the George Box quote, one key assumption that we're going to make here is that linear regression, when we implement effective linear regression, our data set is linear. So we have something called data set linearity. And so essentially we're saying that the relationship between our features and our labels can be well represented by a line. Okay, it's relatively simple, but it is an important distinction that we have to make because if we have, for example, a parabolic uh, or a hyperbolic um, data set, it's not gonna be as easy to represent with this and linear regression is gonna do very terribly, okay? So before we move on, does anyone have any questions? Just really quickly. So when did you know when like linear regression would be fine when it's not mm -hmm. so often what is often what happens, I guess, in um when you're creating like an, an AI algorithm is that you test like linear regression, polynomial regression, uh various other you know types of regression, and you kind of just pick whichever one has the lowest error. Uh, and that goes back to why we introduced this objective like cost error metric. Mm -hmm. Um, it makes it a bit easier to determine like, okay, this one has a cost of 0 0.01. This one has a cost of 0 0.1. Therefore, I want to use, you know, linear regression. And it's more apparent that linear regression itself is like, like that the data set is linear. Um, one other thing you might want to consider is the context of the data. So for example, height versus weight, it's, it's relatively, to my knowledge, linear. Uh, like you wouldn't be, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be like parabolic. Like you wouldn't get lighter as you get. Right. You know, to eight feet, nine feet. Not that I have experience with that, but um, you know, the context as well. So context and then just analyzing the cost. Okay. All right. So point taken. Uh XKCD guy, good question. What if our data doesn't have a linear representation? So what if this cost is super high? What if, for example, we have a data set like this? One more time, okay. I know. I know maybe I'm I'm belaboring this a little, but we're gonna cheer or boo for the, the line that I'm gonna put up on the screen. Um this one. Okay, that was a little lower energy, but you know, I, I kind of sprung it on you. But the answer is also on the screen. Yes, this model is not great. It doesn't capture the the relationship between the variables very well. Uh you can see on the right hand side, there's a lot of large error points. And even on the left-hand side, there's a couple large error points, right? So what can we do? What happens when our data doesn't have a linear representation? We need to make our model more powerful. So we need to make it able to predict on these spaces as well. Okay, so in the context of a linear regression function, we're going to introduce what's called polynomial regression, which more or less it derives from linear regression. It's pretty similar. It's just instead of using a line, it's going to use higher dimensional terms to add curvature, to add uh, more nuance to the prediction, okay? So the equation becomes something like this here, as you can see on the screen. Uh, once again, y hat predicted, but you can see that for each nth degree term, uh, it has a corresponding weight w sub n. And that functions similarly to the slope. It kind of scales that polynomial uh, term in some way in order for us to make better predictions. So once again, you know, nth degree term, weight, y hat predicted. That's the principle of polynomial regression, okay? So we can see a couple examples of polynomial regression here. I'm not gonna make you cheer or boo, but you can see this one's, this is a degree two polynomial, it's a bit better. Fits the data set more, more cleanly and more accurately. And most of the points are not that high in error, right? We can also use this degree six curve. Um, at a glance, right, it seems like it does better at predicting because overall the errors are less, right? But what happens when we add a data point like this? So the red and orange one, or the red and yellow one on all of the screens, it loosely follows the same trend as all of our previous data points, but not exactly. And so here's a side-by-side -side comparison, right? So what does everyone think? Which one's better? Let's take a vote. Okay, if you think the left one is better, raise your hand. I'm not, I'm just done. Okay. One, 
to one and a half, three essentially. Okay, and then if you think the right one is better, raise your hand. A lot more than three. Okay, I tend to agree with the people who are in the majority. Um, the right one is the right one does tend to be better, and the reason why is we can put these lines in, and we can see that the comparison is it, it's a bit hard to make, but if you overlap them. You can see the error on the left is actually larger than the error on the right. Okay. There's a relatively significant difference. The title got cut off, but there's a relatively significant difference here. And we can see that this issue is because the degree six curve kind of fits the data set too well. And the re and we're we're gonna call that overfitting. So we overfit the data set. That's that's yikes. That's bad. And we're going to talk about overfitting again tomorrow, but right now you need to remember that overfitting is kind of bad and that a higher degree is not necessarily a better prediction, okay? So overfitting, to use Nate's example, is like memorizing all the test questions and not knowing really what the knowledge on the test is. And then you get to the, the test day, the exam day, and you're like, oh, question three is different. I have no clue how to do this. And hopefully that's never happened to you, but you know, that's, that's not very good. Anyway, when we optimize our polynomial regression um, to get to this point, we're going to use a very similar method as we did with linear regression. We're going to use this cost function once again. So same thing, difference between y hat and y predicted and actual respectively, square it, sum it, and then regularize it or average it. Okay. So once again, remember that we're correcting by the mean error. So the average error for one prediction and not the total error because if you, if you correct for total error, you're going to, it'll be very, it'll be interesting. Uh, I recommend you try it, but don't, you know, don't expect very good results. Okay. And so in a very similar fashion as well, um, we can sort of expand polynomial regression into higher dimensions. So these prediction models that are generated by higher dimensional polynomial regressions, they're much more complicated than a hyperplane. They become sort of these satellite gradient, like, surfaces um, and shapes. And they're, they're really, they're even more difficult, I would say, to draw on a PowerPoint. But essentially the principle is very, very similar. And for example, we can, recommend, uh, we can represent one of those surfaces by this. There are obviously the nth degree terms that we talked about at the beginning on the left. And then the last term is something known as a cross feature term. So you can see, it multiplies x1 times x2, right? So it crosses the columns. And that's not something we've seen in linear regression or in simple polynomial regression, right? So these cross feature terms are essentially, you know, combining two features together. So if you're predicting house prices, maybe it's combining the number of bedrooms times the number of bathrooms, right? And in combining these, it can change the way the model works a little bit and it can potentially inc improve your model, but it, it depends. You have to look at the cost once again. Okay. So the one thing we're going to remember here is that the implementation of the math behind higher dimensional data and be behind any data stays the same. You build a model, you evaluate the, the, the cost function, and then you minimize the cost function uh, and optimize the model. Okay. So you introduce whatever weights you want, you evaluate the cost function, and then you minimize that cost function with gradient descent with whatever you need to do, okay? So at this point, really quickly, I noticed that none of our, very few of our snacks have been taken. Thank you for taking your snack. So please get up, uh, stretch, take two minutes, take a snack, okay? And we'll reconvene in, in just one or two minutes. there's so many examples of this. Yeah, so all the slides, you know, the PDF is posted on the research thing. I'm going to send there. I've already set it up. Yeah, don't worry. Yeah, I'm going to send it to you. 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 Yeah, I'
Uh, the link to Zoom, no, the Zoom is really just used to the chat from the Oh, you stand there, you can the chat. Yeah, everything will be stored. That's on the But no, it's because we use a lot. Hi. Hello. All right. Glad to see that it's actually getting used straight here. Thank you, by the way. Uh, for bringing them. Um, but yeah, so let's let's go ahead and continue. Uh, some people are free time. All right. So XACV guy is gonna come back. Yeah, I guess he wants that. I don't know. He came back, right? He's gonna ask, what about classification? Right? We've talked a lot about regression. We've talked about linear regression, we've talked about polynomial regression. What happens? when you want to classify um, something like this, right? So as we saw, both models in the 12 features from the wine data set, they, that, that works fine. You know, you can predict a quality score on a continuous zero to 10 scale. But what if, for example, you wanted to predict whether it's a red or a white one, right? So two specific discrete classes, how do you predict that? Well, we're gonna use something called logistic regression, okay? The first thing to note about logistic regression is, is that its name is very, very misleading. So logistic regression is not regression. It is, or in some senses it is, but it's primarily a classification algorithm, okay? So if you need to, write logistic regression, cross it out, and then write classification on top of it. Okay, just so you, just so you remember that regression, that logistic regression is not classification. It is not regression, it's classification. I'm even confusing myself, okay? But anyway, logistic regression is one of our classification algorithms that takes all these input features, just like linear and polynomial, um, and then predicts in two discrete classes that are represented as zero or one. So in our case, it would be red or white one. And we're going to encode these as white equals zero and red equals one. And this is just an arbitrary encoding. Theoretically, you could flip it, but for the sake of you know keeping everyone on the same page, we're going to do this. So this causes an interesting question to arise. If we're using numbers again, and if we're using zeros and ones, why can we just fit like a linear model or a polynomial model in order to make these predictions? Well, I'm going to put up you know a linear example, and you can see that it's not really that great. Um, for example, like we could have this point that is in the middle, okay? It's 0 0.5 and that doesn't really mean anything because if you combine red and white wine, I actually don't know what happens because I can't drink wine, but I don't think it's good. So that doesn't work very well. You can't have something that's above red wine because there, there's nothing redder than red wine, I think. And you can't have something that's below white wine because that's just water. So what we need to do is we need to kind of create a function that is flat on both ends and then very steep in the middle. So it looks something like this, which coincidentally very much reflects, you know, a logistic or sigmoid function. And that's where we got the name logistic regression. Okay. So the equation for this function is represented as follows. Y hat equals big expensive thing. And once again, we can break down this big expensive thing and kind of examine it in more detail and understand why we have what we have. So once again, on the left side, it's very simple, y hat predicted. And then on the right side, we really have a very similar idea of weights corresponding to their specific variables. So for each w sub one, w sub two, whatever, it corresponds to the variable x sub, x, x sub one, x sub two, okay? So, that's it's relatively similar, but there are a couple major differences, one of which is the way that we're making predictions. So logistic regression generally only predicts very near one or very near zero down here or very near one, which is up here. Um, and these are the two classes that it's been trained to predict. So that kind of makes sense. But it does have this very large gray area um, where it gives these values in between zero and one. And the way it deals with this is that it's going to predict, you know, probabilities of potential values. And then it's going to take a specific threshold here called the probability threshold that 
this prediction is going to fall under. So let's say it predicted 0 0.7, that's above the threshold, so we're gonna call it red. If it predicted 0 0.2, then it's below the threshold, it's gonna call it white, okay? So this threshold is called the decision boundary because it decides what we predict, more or less, okay? So before we move on, given that this is a new algorithm, we're going to kind of summarize some of the information that we've gone over so far. So the most important distinction is that logistic regression is classification. And that's very confusing, but you do need to remember that it's classification. Okay, so it outputs two discrete classes uh, when it's predicting. So when we give this model its input features, we're gonna get back either zero or one. Um, and in reality, we actually predict uh, a probability, so somewhere between zero and one, but with our decision boundary, we essentially make all the predictions either zero or one, okay? So in essence, it kind of allows us to, to turn these probabilistic uh, inputs and outputs into discrete classes that we want to predict for. So in order to evaluate the effectiveness of this logistic regression, we also kind of need to build a new cost function. And it looks something like this. Um, it's also kind of very complicated. Some of it might be cut off by some of the Zoom things. Don't worry, we'll go ahead and examine each part specifically. But when you look at it, you can see that there are two main distinct kind of parts, right, for, for, for the cost function. There's this one, and then there's this one. And so when we graph each of these two, we can kind of understand why we have these two distinct parts. So let's start with the left. So the left one looks like this, it's the red line, okay? And you can see that it's very high, very close to zero. And it's very, pre it actually hits zero when it, it's at one. Okay, and then the opposite happens for the other one. So let's look at the two parts together. Why? Why is this? It's because we can see that, you know, this, uh, this coefficient here for each of these cases is notably, it's a y and not a y hat, which means that it's always either going to be one or zero. So if we're predicting, if we're supposed to be predicting zero, this is this part is zero and this part is one. So this is eliminated. And then this is the, the only thing that's evaluated, okay? Whereas if, if we're predicting one, then this part is eliminated and we're only evaluating this part. And then when we go back to the graphs, you can see that here, if you're predicting one, you have a cost of zero because it's correct. And the closer you get to zero, the higher it gets. That makes sense, right? Okay, and then similar thing, but flipped for here. So zero is correct, one is super incorrect, okay? And this essentially allows us to pack two cost functions, so to speak, into one. It's not actually two cost functions. These both functions are evaluated every time. It's just that the coefficients and the way the coefficients work will eliminate one of these two parts. Okay, so that's a little clever way of choosing the specific cost function that we want to use um, at each time. So there are also some times that we have more than two classes for output. So we can, for example, extend our wine example beyond simple binary classification by taking white wine, red wine, and champagne, right? So how do we use this binary classifier to classify these three types of wines? There are two main ways that we're gonna do this, um, one versus one and one versus all classification. So one versus one is where we take all of the possible classes and then we pair them up with each other. So one, versus another one. So since we have three possible classes, we make three possible pairs. So white versus red, white versus champagne, and red versus champagne. Okay, so those are our three possible pairs. And then now that we have pairs once again, we can go ahead and just build binary classifiers and do the same thing that we just did, okay? So let's say the first one votes white, the second one votes white, and the third one votes champagne. The class with the most votes, in this case white, is the one that's predicted. So we're gonna go ahead and predict white one. There is, like this, this works okay, this works fine, but what happens when we introduce this white wine into the red and champagne classifier, right? It doesn't, it's neither, neither of the categories is correct. So like what happens when we actually uh, evaluate it, right? So let's go ahead and graph this. So red is at the top and then champagne's at the bottom. What white wines appear as is kind of something like this. Okay, it's just kind of in the middle. There's, it's, we're, we're just forcing a square peg into a round hole. And we can't describe this. The model that we're using doesn't describe this data point well at all. 
And this is one of the reasons why we have the alternate version called one versus all classification. Okay, so one versus all classification is going to do something like this. So it compares white to everything that isn't white. So one versus all or the rest. And then red to everything that isn't red and then champagne to everything that isn't champagne. So in this case, if you put like a white wine in the red classifier, it's just gonna say, oh, it's not red. I don't know what it is, but it's not red. And in that case, it kind of solves our square peg round hole problem. Okay, and that's kind of why this classifier exists. And then once again, let's say, um, usually we represent the knots as zeros. So let's say we throw a white wine in. The white wine might give like a 0 0.9 probability. This one might give 0 0.2. This one might give 0 0.3. So what we want to do is we just pick the answer with the highest probability. And then simply, that's it. So when we go through all the classifiers, we go ahead, yoink the one with the highest probability. That's our prediction. Okay, so to summarize, um, it's been a, a bit of a long lecture, a lot of information. So quick summary. What artificial intelligence is, is it just takes a model um, or uses a model to take in a data set of inputs and then provide you with a set of outputs that it isn't explicitly coded to give you. So it does a task that it isn't explicitly coded to do. And there are three different types of models that we can use, linear regression, polynomial regression, and logistic regression. These are separated in two categories. There are regressions and there are classifications. And then this whole idea of regression classification is put under another umbrella of supervised learning, okay? So these three models, separate these two off uh, on the left, take this one, okay? Those are our two categories, regression, classification, and then everything falls under supervised learning. And then supervised learning obviously falls under the umbrella of AI, okay? And so we can make you know, discrete predictions over here. We can make continuous predictions over here. But all we're doing in supervised learning is we're taking these inputs and outputs and we're fitting some sort of function. We're learning some sort of function in order to make our predictions, okay? So given that we just kind of took a break, um, 